Hi, my name is Solomon Omeru, and with me is Odidion Okonkwo, and together we're going to be hosting this segment of the Afrocentrist podcast titled Discovery Tuesday. It's going to be a world of discovery where we'll have fun hanging out together as we bring you insights that will inform and educate you on topical issues bordering on relationship. This will help you discover yourself and enable you to make better choices as you go through your unique life experiences. Coming to you every Tuesday at 4 p.m. GST. Remember, Self-discovery is the first step to true freedom. See you there. Hi, it's Tuesday again, and welcome to the Afrocentrist podcast. This is your host, Solomon Omero. Today, I have a very special guest. She's known as a walking miracle. She's an author. She's a trainer. She's a life coach and a model. Our works have reached across Asia, UK, Europe, US, the Middle East, and Africa. She's an author of the Turn Your Passion Into Profit and Five Things I Love About Being a Woman. Her name is Zai Mystique. Today we're going to be talking about turning your pain into profit. The couple of years have been challenging, there have been a lot of um, issues and struggles. But yet, so many people out there are still thriving and pushing forward. So today we're going to bring in Zai Mystique, and she's going to help us see how we can go through that struggle and make good out of it. Hey, Zai, welcome online. Hi, how are you? So Zai, let's let's start let's start with this question: Who is Zai Mystique? Let, let's hear about you. Okay, so my name is Zai. I'm from Singapore. And here I am living in Dubai, and I'm glad we met at a business event. Solomon, thank you for having yeah. me on the show. So basically, I'm an author. I've written two books, Turn Your Passion Into Profit, and Five Things I Love About Being a Woman. I now run a motivational training company where I'm on a journey of helping people to step up and be the strong, soulful success they are all meant to be. Mm, wow. Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah, I was reading about you and there's so many amazing things about you. But there's one of one story I read, one article I read about the accident you had a couple of years ago. Do you yeah. want to share that story with us? Sure. So I met with an accident. I guess that's how I turned my pain into power. One of the things that happened, right? So basically, I met with an accident. Um, I was in a taxi. The driver fell asleep. And it was like 4 plus p.m. And he hit the back of an army trailer, like a huge trailer. He hit it. And there you go. Actually, uh, I was like the pillion. I was sitting behind the driver. He escaped nothing. He had like a little cut on his eyebrow here. But I had a fracture and dislocation of my spine. I have eight screws, two metal rods on my spine. And doctor said I may not be able to walk anymore. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, it was terrible when I heard it. Uh, I knew I was in a lot of pain, but the thing was, they said 95% of the chance is that even after the operation, you would not be able to walk anymore. And then I was, of course, devastated. Um, but the pain was so painful that I said, you know what, whatever, just send me for the operation. I can't take the pain anymore. But one of the things that kept me strong was the fact that I wanted to stay alive and be healthy again to take care of my mother. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. So I can imagine that. Yeah, that was my, I would say, my pillar of strength. The only thing that kept my will very strong. And even after the operation, is true, I was on, uh, I was bedridden. I was on self-control morphine for three, four, four weeks hospital and after like six months I had to learn how to walk again and just imagine like prior to that I used to be a model I run we you know walk cat walk runway what have you not I traveled the world but everything came to a standstill I had to learn how to walk again so these are the things we want to give thanks for the fact that we can breathe without pain can speak without pain we can walk and we are so blessed but sometimes we forget and that's why we fall into this emotional um, turbulence, a quick sense of depression or something that just makes us feel down. 
So just to end that quickly, I actually decided a year into the accident, do I want to be victim or victor? Mm. I made yeah, a decision. A to victor, yeah. So moving from victim to victor, what, what was it that I wanted out of life? I started questioning God. I said, oh, why didn't I die from the accident? Oh, why? What, what's my purpose on earth? Like, who is God? What is God? What is this? What's going on? So all those questions... I'm sure you've had that moment, Solomon. You know, that yeah. those are the questions that um, made me start to think about why was I given a second chance to step up my game? What was my purpose? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So what what is Johnny yeah. like? Because, you know, we just, we've, we're in the post-COVID phase and a lot of people have lost loved ones. A lot of people yeah. have lost a lot of things that are very dear to them. Some of them are jobs, career opportunities. How do you go through that phase? A lot of people have lost their job. A lot of, but let's think about it. A lot of people have died. Yeah. That's, that's like true. ultimatum. But maybe to some of us hearing this, we're like, oh, I would rather die than go through all this, right? <laughs> well, I've had, of course, all of us have said that, oh my God, I'd rather die than go through all this, like, Damn, why do I have to go through this? But at the end of the day, this will bring to another series in my life, a very big episode, bigger than the pain of my accident, mm -hmm. was when I had to lose my mom three years ago. The post grief, when she was diagnosed cancer five years ago, and then uh, to go through that whole process of knowing, oh my God, I'm going to lose my mother. Are you mm -hmm. kidding me? Of course, it was not that cool. It was so painful. Every millisecond, I was dying inside. Um, but I had to be strong. I had to face it. I wanted her to be painfully comfortable and happy. That was my only aim for two years. And then she passed on. And then what's there left? Nothing. So for those of you who are feeling broken, like there's no hope, there's no meaning, life has no meaning. I kept saying this for a whole six months after she died. I said, I have nothing left in this form. I don't want anything in this form. And then I read a book by Victor Franklin. I uh, can't remember the title now. He said, "If you have not, the world has nothing to offer you, but you still have a lot to offer the world." Wow, that's amazing. Ah, that was difficult. Like imagine, because I, I wrote books, I'm a motivational trainer, I speak, I do all this stuff. I'm a henna artist. I have so much of talents. So one of the prayer I recently found, which is so amazing, um, was, uh, God, which of my talent do you want me to use right now? Mm -hmm. And it's crazy. Okay. The moment I made, because uh, I remember many years ago before I wrote my book, the prayer was, I, I understood that serving God is in serving his creation. So I said, God, melt me, mold me, fill me and use me. When God melt, mold, fill and use me, the beauty was... Uh, I started writing books. I started speaking on stage. I have bloody pub public speaking fear. No freaking way I can do this ever. I never dreamed that I can do this. Like, no script, no questions, right? We said, yeah, love, free flow. Let's do it. Because I prayed, God melt me, mold me, feel me. And you. So I believe that everything that I'm doing right now, I pray is divine works. I pray that God is accepting from us. So right now, yeah. my latest prayer was, um, which of my talents do you want me to make use of now? And then when I arrived to Dubai, it has been fashion modeling, runway, a photo shoot in the desert, fashion show. So with the step up journey, I'm. You see, guys, why I'm sharing this? This is not about me. I want to share with you the possibility, what what is possible in the world, and the opportunities that will come to you. So as much as I'm running the company, training, speaking. And I want to write more books about parenting in the 21st century. We spoke about resilient, confident parents, raise confident, compassionate kids. I also am taking on this journey as a hijab model. Share that modesty, your honor, your dignity belongs to you. It's God-given. And you can walk your runway to resilience. That's my hashtag, runway yeah. to resilience. And to be the model role model. So a lot of the that's, young that's kids, amazing. young guys, boys, girls I meet at the events, they're like, oh, you're so cool. I want to be like you when I grow up. And I'm like, ah, thanks for reminding me I grew older. But that's the idea, <laughs> right? Intention. The intention was to be the model, role model. And at the end of the five days fashion show event and stuff, the next morning, a girl from Nigeria, 
Aisha, she wrote mm-hmm. to me, she said, um, Zah, you are so cool. I want to be like you when I grow up. And I'm like, yay, my model role model intention came true. And this is it. This is right. Yeah. That's yeah. Great. Awesome. Yeah. That's, that's beautiful. So let's take a step, a couple of steps backwards, right before yeah. the accident. Now, at 21, you were already in Tokyo as an entrepreneur yeah. with the yeah. earner hat. How did you do that? How? At 21? Okay, so the question is at 20. Actually, I went to Japan when I was 20 to bring my henna art skill. Oh. 20, because I remember celebrating my 21st birthday in Japan. Okay. Yeah. So I was 20 right after school. And during schooling days, I used to do a lot of uh, make. I was a makeup artist. Remember, I was model, makeup artist, henna artist and stuff. Then I met a friend who used to live in Japan. She was a stranger. She met me and she's like, you know what? Your henna skill, if you take it to Japan, you'll be so cool. And I was only 20. I didn't drop out of school, guys. So you don't have to follow that trend of dropping out of school. I finished school. I finished my diploma, like college. Yeah. Anyways, so I finished school. Uh, Thanks for that reminder, school. by the way. <laughs> yeah, you know what? Like all the success people have like, oh, I drop out of school. You don't have to have your basic foundation at least. That is uh, kind of sound and useful for you, you know, security somewhat. But anyway, have your basic education. I met this friend. She said, hey, you know what? Let's do this in Japan. You make lots of money. And then I'm like, really? Like, who would think to bring henna to Japan? Like, I never clicked. Never clicked. Yeah. And then and then I just trusted the process. I was like, okay, so we saved some money. Brought, like, um, very little. Bought a ticket. We had some money. And two weeks Day, became a six month stay in Japan. Wow. Yeah. So what happened? I'm gonna share how it all happened. The pain, the turning pain into power. This is another pain to power journey. So when I arrived, it was still winter. My friends said it was spring. You could do henna like street art. So we brought our tables, our chairs and stuff. You know, we like street artists to do henna. Mm-hmm. And when I arrived the airport, it was so cold. I'm like, oh my god, the aircon is so strong. But it's not the air conditioning, it's still winter, that's why it's so cold. <laughs> I was 20, my first big travel. I was like, I can't do this. Like, this is not going to happen, right? And then I stayed for two weeks. Uh, for the first week, I was like, I'm sure God brought me here for a reason. I cannot go home with nothing. So I started yeah. visiting. I, I visited uh, the music store. I found a magazine, international magazine, featuring cultural works. So I wrote to them. So I'm giving you guys a very big business tip here. But I wrote to yeah. them and said, hey, I'm, I'm Indian. I'm from Singapore. I do henna art. I would love to get featured in your magazine. And guess what? It's International Cultural Magazine. Of course, they featured us. Wow. And then we were interviewed, got photos and stuff. So quickly, I bought a mobile phone because our Vodafone, the Japan, Japan they use Vodafone. They don't use our SIM card or something. I can't remember. Now, maybe it's different. But I got a phone. I was equipped. I made sure our number was on that editorial. And people started calling us for henna service. Someone wanted us to teach henna art. And we had a lot of Japan. event companies. Event companies calling us. Can you come down and do henna like for an hour or two at our events? You can charge or we'll pay you by the hour, blah, blah, blah. And how didn't two weeks become a six-month stay? Yeah. Oh, that's an interesting story. So what was the biggest motivation? Because most, most people will look at it like, traveling all the way down to Japan with the whole trend back then. That was like years ago. No one would believe there's, there could be anything like Ehena in Japan. So what was the confidence you had? What motivated you that it could work? I don't know about my confidence and motivation to just take it to Japan. I trusted the friend. Okay, maybe I was naive. Lucky she didn't tell me or something. <laughs> but yeah. <laughs> and that was, um, I, I knew I wanted to explore. I love the art. I felt a strong calling. This is the thing. Yeah. When opportunities yeah. come before us, many, many, many times we turn things down. There are people who take advantage of talents and professionals. They want things for free. They want collaborations. But in Dubai, you know this word. Collaboration is like, come do free work. I'm so sick of this. Yeah. But seriously, if you are a talent, you are a professional, even if you don't know what is your passion, go find what is your talent. Tell people, hey, you know what? I like doing um, hairstyling. Can I style your hair? And now with social media. Uh, yeah. This is 20 years ago. I had no social media, nothing. 
But even with my hijab business, after the accident, I started, I was on a journey to find God. I wanted to start wearing the hijab. There was no hijab fashion 15, 16 years ago. I think True. we are some of the few who started the trend. Look trendy, to look cool, to look modest, to still look, not look like our aunties. <laughs> <laughs> so I will say we were that. like top four people in the in Singapore who started the hijab uh, fashion business. I started with this inner, which I bought in Syria, you know, like the inner capping. Like I had only yeah. five colors. And then it became 90 over colors. It started with just that and then shawls and then clothes and then abaya. And then I traveled to Morocco. I brought the Moroccan jilaba, you know, that like kaftan with the hoodie. So cool. And then like a whole home boutique. And I started not only selling to people, I encouraged people, women. And even I had guys from New Zealand, from BVI, British Virgin Island, who bought supplies and started reselling stuff. So I taught people how to start home business. Wow, that's that's an interesting story. Now I can understand the, the whole idea behind your book. So your that's passion, why I wrote passion. the book, Third Year of Fashion. Yeah. Okay, but that was not even why I why I wrote that book. was another big story, if I can share with you. So oh, um, I have a following on my Facebook with uh, the henna, the hijab business and stuff. I, I traveled. Then I got bored with the businesses. I said, I want to go learn Arabic. So I was in Jordan, Morocco, Yemen for two years to learn Arabic. So I speak Arabic now. Yeah. Oh, sure. And not so advanced, but yeah, well, I can speak it. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> the beautiful thing was when before I came back from Yemen to Singapore, I prayed. I asked God, what do you want me to do? And I go back, you know, show me a sign. So prayer is so important. I believe this too. Prayers yeah. is so powerful and so important, but we always forget God and we always forget to trust His divine process. So I prayed, I said, God, what do you want me to do? He said, he said uh, there was this morning where I woke up and serving God is in serving his creation. So I said, okay, what do I do? Tell me. So I came back into Singapore. A lot of people started asking me, like, what we are having on this interview. How did you pick up yourself from the accident? How do you start your business? How do you travel so much and everything? So the one thing that, uh, then uh, on the 10th day, a lady on my Facebook contacted me and she said, like, can I speak to you? She messaged me. I said, okay, let me call you. We spoke. And in the 10th minute, she said, thank you for talking to me. I was just thinking of committing suicide. And I feel better now. Oh. Yeah. Oh. And that shook me and I was shocked. But at the same time, I said, what can I do about this? I didn't ask her. I asked myself after. Of course, when I talked to her, I said, oh, sister, if you need anything to call me, I'm here for you. When I hung up, I said, it's not the hijab business, it's not the henna business, it's nothing. What is it? So then I got inspired. Maybe I can teach people to turn their passion into profit. Because maybe money is the problem, right, Solomon? <laughs> well, <laughs> then I realized money wasn't the solution. Money is a very useful, powerful tool. But then again, self-confidence, self-love, appreciating, respecting yourself, having kindness, compassion, and being humble at the end of the day. And Absolutely. all of us are struggling. Why yeah. pretend? Yeah, why the world? Why is the world pretending? So much of glitters yeah. in Dubai. Sometimes people should be happy and thriving. So much of glitters in Dubai. Oh my God. And not just Dubai, <laughs> I think everywhere. Okay, Even well, Dubai, well I'm in Dubai, so I represent Dubai now. Yeah, huh? All of them in Dubai, but everywhere. But I like what you said. I said a lot of people pretend. Yeah, not just in Dubai alone. But even in third world countries, in African countries, and all of that. Yeah. But but what we're trying to do is help people understand that they could be who they want to be, or they could come forth as real. You know. Yeah. Whatever they are going through, whatever their situation is, it can still be useful. You mustn't be shining and glamorous to be useful yeah. or to get heard. So yeah. this is the message you're trying to, to put out there. So I like what you yeah. said. People are pretending, but things. Are going to go a lot easier if they can come out of that uh, um covering and you know put themselves out there for real yeah that's i think question. i have an answer i've been i've been reflecting on this the last two weeks i think now as you are asking it it came to me my god you see there's a difference between pretending and mm -hmm. presenting being presentable and yeah. faking it yeah you know so there's pretending, presenting, and then you're just like doing all you can to like fake it till you make it. So 
funny I said pretend and fake it twice, but there's a difference between being presentable, being authentically do, and trying to do works versus I need to do some fillers to do uh, the same like others to plan into. I think people are losing a sense of acceptance. They want a sense of acceptance and a sense of belonging. Mm-hmm. So we need to fake it. And I don't know, I'm thinking. It's just like you need to fake it so you belong. And then that's when you lost who you truly are. Yesterday, I was on a yacht with 40 of us. And I was the only hijabi brown person. It was all Russian, speaking Russian. <laughs> but I felt so cool and happy on the boat. I was like cool oh. and I speak some Russian and I was just being me, sharing my thing and and we connected with some of us on IG. Maybe some of them haven't met Muslims or brown person. Maybe it's their first interaction with the brown hijabi Muslim women and it was so cool. Yeah, and but I I must admit I did take an extra uh, effort to be presentable. Like I wore a pretty dress. I made sure my makeup was not like over but nice. And because you're presenting and representing. Yeah, yeah. So if I hear you very well, it's um, there's a difference between faking it and being presentable. So rather than mm-hmm. trying to make people believe you're something that you're not. It's just better to polish what you are and put it out there. Yeah. It was very right. cool. Right? I just like listened to them. Oh, what do you do? Or oh, this is what I do. Maybe we can do something together. It was so natural and nice. You don't have yeah. to fake anything. But that's how the world has been built. True. Like everyone's makeup look like everyone on social media, Instagram now. Seven layers of makeup. I was at a fashion show. I couldn't recognize myself after the lady did my makeup. I mean, it was nice but i'm like this is not me and then blue contact lens i'm like <laughs> why <laughs> are people buying that. into this ideology <laughs> and you'll be surprised like half yeah. or 70 percent of the room maybe before that they didn't notice me but after that they were like oh how pretty jamila jamila and i'm like oh i was pretty this is not me <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I that's was. true. I think the view of the society, uh, but but I like what you said. Once you once you make yourself different, once you yeah. come out real, people will want to associate with you. You yes. know, tell your own story, um, be yeah. real with yourself. I think most people are also tired of this fake version of life, and uh, there's a lot of um, trends on TikTok, Instagram. Where people are showing their real selves now, what they are going through, real experiences, yeah. and people are jumping on that trend. Yeah. So I think yeah, I'm that's so the, that's the new way to go. But you see, this awesome. is the thing. This is the thing. This is where people are painted, but they are painting as something that they are not. Instead of yeah. speaking about that pain, speaking about grief. Speaking mm-hmm. about, yeah, I, when I was briefing, I speak a lot to a lot of people, shared a lot. And now I had a friend losing, almost losing the father in Singapore. I texted her. I called her. I know how to be present. Being present is the greatest present, but we are losing it. We're just pretending. Yeah. Mm. Very true. True. Mm. So it's not unnatural to have pain. The only thing is rather than hiding the pain or trying to pretend Pull it out there, use it to help other people and work with a community that helps you fight through it. Yes, 100%. I always believe God will never burden a soul with what we cannot carry. True, 100%. And yeah. I, it's in the Bible, it's in the Quran too. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I'm sure yeah, it's that, in the that's, other that's books as well. Do you know this is in the oh, Quran yeah. as well? Or do you know it's in the Bible? Maybe, yeah, of course. Yeah, I know it's in the Bible. Yeah. Rabbana la tu hamina God, we won't burden us with what we cannot burden. So this thing, there's always wisdom in the pit or in the situation. I'm not saying if someone abuse you, be it men or women, I mean, men get abused too verbally, emotionally, whatever. I'm not saying they'll find the wisdom in that. No, get up and do something about it. That's that's not patience, that's stupidity. So, yeah, coming back to the real, like, accident. Like, okay, I know why the accident happened to me. Because I say this all the time. 
God told me to take a break from the wall, but I kept going and going and going. So he had to break my spine. Wow, that's a, <laughs> that's another way to look at it. Wow, okay. Yeah, and even losing my mom, it was difficult. But then I learned nothing is permanent on this earth. And yeah, you love her. You you love her for you, or do you love her for her? Are you willing to let go? And I'm like, damn, how do I deal with this? And I learned. Wow, that's 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 interesting. I, I like the way you see things. I like the way you see things. So this is what I want to do. That our, our listeners out there want to know. Now we're, we're talking mostly to to people in Africa and beyond. So those going through struggles, those going through challenges, how do you think they can come out of it strong? How can they turn that into purpose? Well, I have my ebook and my audio book and my digital training videos on my website stepupjourney.com. I made it very affordable so that people can enjoy it and learn it. So seeking knowledge is the first step. We for us to turn our pain into power to step up. First step first, you need to invest in your knowledge yourself. If you think, oh, I know this, I got this, okay, do what you know. But when I am at a stage, uh, when I'm on stage, I'm teaching, it's different. But when I'm in a classroom, I zero my cup. I learn. I want to learn what can I do better. So ask yourself, if there's something you are passionate about, you want to be an entrepreneur. What do you want to sell? Who do you want to sell to? Who are the first 10 people you can share? Hey, I have this um, lipstick. Want to try it? It suits you. Before it used to be $20. Now it's just 10 US dollars. Can I get testimonies from you if you try it? Because I need to build my portfolio, my profile. So if you want to step out, you cannot just stay contained in one place. I got sick of Singapore. I travel all the time. But the moment I left, I came here, I started the hijab fashion thing. I met some businesses who want to print 5,000 copies of my books and translate it into Arabic and have it distributed. And we have some works in Africa as well. So I feel like very big calling for Africa next. So now yeah. with this podcast, is like confirm Afrocentrist podcast. So this is like a, a confirmation because I took the first step first. True. We have nothing to start with. You have somebody's product to sell. You have your service. Henna, how did I start my henna business with zero dollars? The henna was brought to me by my cousin. She said, Zai, can you draw this for me? I said, I don't know. She said, I think you know. I said, okay, I try. So I received a $5 henna cone for free. I drew it. She left it. She gave my first $10. Next week, she was going to a wedding. And she came again. I draw one hand, two hand, three hands, four hands. She gave me $50. That's how I started. With $0. I didn't even know I could draw henna. Fine. What is that one thing you can or cannot do? Ask people, what do you think I'm good at? Why can I try? Social media is good, but don't fall into the trap. It's so exhausting. Yeah. So the best way to turn your pain or struggle into power is get the knowledge required. Mm. Seek out knowledge and then find a way to come out of it and offer services to the world. I, I like this thing you keep repeating, saying serving God or serving the creator is serving his creation. And there's always power in service. So whatever pain we go through, turning it into service is the only way we can make it powerful. Yeah. And turn yeah. it to power. That's amazing. I've learned a lot from you this evening, Zai. Thanks for coming around. And please, uh, my listeners over there, go check out Zai's book. Uh, it's interesting. She has two books out there. Am I correct, Zai? Yeah, Turn Your Passion yeah. into Profit and Five Things I Love About Being a Woman. And 20 more books coming up. Pray that oh, I so have a long life so I can do this and keep doing it. Yeah. <laughs> definitely, definitely. Long, sure. healthy life. Yeah. Amen. <laughs> I God bless all of thank you. Please take care. And uh, thank you for doing this, Solomon. Thank you very much, Zai. So thank you for spending your time with us again this evening at the Afrocentrist podcast on this section of um, Discovery Tuesday. Zai's story was interesting. Please share the story. You can also follow Zai at Zai.mystique on Instagram and our website is stepupdiscovery.com. And also you can follow us at the Afrocentrist podcast. We'll always bring interesting and educating content.
Take care, Tim. See you next time.